Well, welcome to the very uh, first episode of our new Shoreline podcast called Shoreline Conversations. My name is Cole Lovelace. I am the Worship Experiences Director here at Shoreline Church, and uh, we're just trying something new. We're uh, we're looking to just see how this uh, forms and shapes, and we're, we're excited for the way this is going to go. But for the first 12 weeks of this, we're actually going to be kind of going in parallel with our series on Romans. And so uh, we have Pastor Kevin here for the first time uh, doing an interview style thing. But uh, yeah, I would just encourage you to, to, to tune in weekly. We're, we're excited to see where this goes. And welcome to our first episode of Shoreline Conversations. So Kevin, for uh, you know a lot of the listeners now, they're probably congregants, but also there's a potential for you know a lot of people in our community to be uh, interested in these topics and such. So I just kind of wanted to uh, get a quick, you know, who are you? What do you do? And and honestly, uh, I know that this time of moving forward in like the digital world of ministry has yeah. been a big shift for a lot of churches. And just kind of hear your yeah. your take on how that's changed for your your day to day. Yeah. Well. Cole, for a quick snapshot, I, you know, like every human being, I have lots of aspects to my life. So <laughs> on a personal level, I got a wife who I'm crazy about. I got three sons that I like a whole lot. Uh, they all have wives. And so now I have daughters in my life yeah. and uh, we've got two grandkids. And so that's, you know, a huge part of my life. Mm -hmm. Professionally, I'm pastor at Shoreline Church, the lead pastor and get to do a lot of preaching and teaching and love doing that. And also my wife and I have a writing, uh, track that we run mm -hmm. on where we write small group studies, Bible studies, and books. And that's a big part of our lives. And so it's uh, something that drives us to think in detail about lots, yeah. of, lots of stuff. And then also uh, along the last 30 years, my wife and I have developed something called Organic Outreach International, mm -hmm. which is now an international ministry that helps churches not just focus on themselves, but really focus on their community mm -hmm. and bring God's love outward in natural ways. I always say ways that don't freak people out and don't freak <laughs> themselves out when they're doing it. And so... Uh, and then when I get a little spare time, I if there's snow on the ground on a hill, I like to snowboard. I'm mm. Crazy about that. And if there's uh, if it's warm and sunny, or even kind of cool and blustery, but I can <laughs> hit a few golf balls, I love yeah. that too. So that that's me in a minute and ten seconds. In ten seconds, yeah. you counted yourself. Yeah. yeah. So so again, how how is this affecting you know this digital online yeah. world? How how's that kind of um, shifting and shaping your ministry yeah. here at yeah. Shoreline? Yeah. Well, probably like most things, there's there's upsides and downsides. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think that shifting to the digital world uh, opens up uh, different people engaging. So, for instance, Shoreline has lots of military folks yeah. Yeah. who come here for eight months, 18 months, maybe three years, and then they're off somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But they love the church. And now that we offer so many things online, we've had a lot of military people dip their toe back yeah. in or become reconnected. Uh, it helps people who are shut in or homebound. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've been, and we've been pushed as a church to do everything we can uh, online and eventually we'll do things back on campus. Absolutely. We're starting to do some things on campus yeah. already, Sunday services, outdoors, yeah. a few a few different things. But really, we look to the future and say everything we do mm -hmm. will be online and on campus. Yeah. And so there's that's exciting, yeah. but it's also challenging because every person doing ministry who used to do it on campus is having to think in a broader yeah. way. And that's stretching people, including you, yes, it uh, is. As, as our worship leader. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, but I, I find that there's ways that God uses this for some very good things, but mm -hmm. it's also quite challenging. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I, I'm, I'm right there with you. I know I, I, things have changed a lot. They've shifted a lot and it's, it's funny how it's, it's a lot of fun and it's, uh, it's exhilarating and it's very, um, it's gotten my creative juices flowing for sure. Yeah. It's ma making me think a lot and it's, but it's, it's tiring. Yeah. It's, there's a lot of, a lot of different things to think about, but it's been a fun, fun experience. So, Hey, I know that we are, um, as a church, we're kind of jumping into this 12 week uh, series with Romans and, mm -hmm. and there's a lot going on with Romans. And mm -hmm. a big thing that we're focusing on is, is kind of these two um, maybe uncommon words uh, mm -hmm. for a lot of people and it's orthodoxy mm -hmm. and orthopraxy. So I kind of want to just get your, your take on those yeah. and just some, some mm -hmm. uh, definitions so that we can kind of grasp that for yeah. these next 12 weeks. And first I'll say that, you know, for some churches, they'd say, well, 12 weeks, that's a long series. Yeah. For other people, they said it's a short series. Uh, uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones did a series. I think it was multiple years yeah. on the book of Romans. Right. So that's a short yeah. series. <laughs> yeah. For Shoreline, 12 weeks lingering in one spot is, a, is a, it stretches us. Significant. Yeah. And so why, why spend 12 weeks mm -hmm. on this? Well, 
You know, orthodoxy and orthopraxy kind of go hand in hand. Uh, orthodoxy, that which is orthodox, is really based on the concept of right belief. Mm -hmm. Orthodoxy is what's correct belief, and it's from a Christian worldview, yeah. that's biblical belief. What is true to the scriptures, what is true and biblical. And so that's orthodoxy. If somebody is being orthodox, they're thinking the right way, thinking biblically. Mm -hmm. Orthopraxy is right praxis, your pra uh, right practice, right. Uh, praxis, what we do. And so orthopraxy is how am I living my life? Mm -hmm. And when you read the Bible, the book of James talks about, you know, true wisdom is knowing what's true and then doing it, not just being a hearer of the word, but doing what it says. Right, right. And so when we talk about orthodoxy and orthopraxy, we're looking at correct belief that leads to correct living. So mm -hmm. the first 11 chapters of Romans are really all about orthodoxy. It's what we believe. It starts the first chapter with sin, it moves, and then it moves through a whole process of what's called the gospel, the truth that God's revealed into the world, the good news that God brings to our world. But the first 11 chapters are pretty heavy in terms of what do we believe. Yeah. But when you get that right, chapters 12 through 16, mm -hmm. the rest of Romans is orthopraxy. Mm -hmm. If this is true, then live this way. Yeah. If this isn't true, then you wouldn't live this way. But because it's true, and so there's this logical progression. Yeah. And orthodoxy and orthopraxy even if we don't recognize it, it's something that really everybody lives with because we have things we believe that impact how we live. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I was thinking as you're saying that it's an interesting relationship between the two, but uh, it, it seems like that could be applicable to, you know, religious, non-religious Christian mm -hmm. yeah. uh, doctrine or, or, or otherwise. So is that, yeah. is there a, is there like a concept of that in, in yeah. the world in general? Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's, there's social orthodoxy. Yeah. There is political orthodoxy, yeah. which we're, you know, if you, if you agree with you, know, we have such a clear orthodoxy that if you don't agree with me, you're on the other side of the fence yeah. or you're probably in big trouble. Yeah. Right. And, and then orthopraxy, it impacts how we live. Even you think of even somewhere like people, uh, and I, I've heard this from people who are chaplains who work in mm -hmm. jails, that there's a moral system within the jail system. Mm -hmm. There's an orthodoxy. Absolutely. Yeah. So if somebody comes into jail and they have murdered someone, another person comes into jail and they've, and they have abused a child. It's a whole different thing. It's very different. <laughs> um, and in, 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 the, yeah. in that kind of hierarchy and in that way that the prison functions, that person who's been hurting children or hurting, hurting women, they oftentimes are treated with, with great severity mm -hmm. uh, because there's an orthodoxy of what's right and wrong. You say, well, gosh, people who are in prison, do they have a sense of moral boundaries and right and wrong? Oh, there's a very clear system of belief. I think that's true for every single human being. Yeah. Even somebody who says, I don't believe anything. And that's absolutely true. You go, well, that's a belief system, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's interesting. Cause yeah, it's, uh, you know, you hear that a lot about the, the realities of jail and I think in prisons and stuff. And I think that's a common thing people are aware of. Mm -hmm. And just to give it context like that, it's, it's interesting, but, uh, moving kind of back to the church, I'm, I'm, I'm curious kind of with different, you know, Christian groups, mm -hmm. I feel like, um, there's a different set of core beliefs in a lot of uh, different church groups and stuff. So what, uh, what do they hold as Orthodox? Yeah. yeah. Well, and I would say if a group is outside the core beliefs of Orthodoxy, yeah. they're probably not even a Christian church. Okay. They might have a label. They might call themselves a church. Yeah. But in terms of the Christian church, you know, God's word is what establishes mm -hmm. what we believe. And that really, that was really developed over time as Christians as, as, as God gave his word, as Christians were grappling with what we believe, what we affirm, mm -hmm. where we stand. And, and so through history, Christians have, you know, kind of made efforts to clarify, this is what we believe. Yeah. So there's, there's what are called creeds. There's three primary, right. what are called ecumenical creeds, ecumenical meaning lots of different churches. Right. But if you can't sort of stand with us mm -hmm. or raise your voice with us and declare these things, you're not within the mainstream yeah. of Orthodox historical Christianity. Absolutely. And so like the Apostles' Creed, which, you know, and somebody, you know, maybe many of our listeners would say, man, I can remember as a kid in church, you know, reciting together or reading mm -hmm. together, you know, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Yeah. And in Jesus, do you remember any of this? I grew and, up in the yeah. Lutheran church. <laughs> I said this every morning. <laughs> yeah, Jesus Christ is only son of our Lord, who's conceived yeah. by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Now, I didn't grow up in the church at all. Yeah. But I, and I learned these things later. And then like the Nicene Creed, which is, is recited more in the Catholic background. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then there's, a, there's a, a creed called the Athanasian Creed. And the Athanasian Creed isn't very often used in church services, even very liturgical churches. Yeah. Because it's so weighty and it's so repetitive, but it's really looking mm -hmm. at the two natures of Jesus, the fact that he was fully God and fully man, and also the three, that, that, that God is, is one in being, but three in persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the right. Trinity. And so 
through history, Christians have debated and mm-hmm. at times in history, let's, let's say got a little bit fired up and even fought over <laughs> and sometimes yeah. fought, not just in terms of verbally yeah. Uh, yeah. over what is it that we believe because, because they, they say it's that important. Yeah. And so I would say that there are certain things that the Bible teaches that mm-hmm. are, that you simply can't compromise on. And if you do, you're no longer a church. You're no longer a Christian. Right. And, and, but it's those core things. Your salvation is through Jesus Christ alone. Yeah. Uh, the, the Bible is God's word, and it's sort of the in the Reformation, the the, the solus, you know, soli scriptura, the scriptures only, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know by, by faith alone, by grace alone, by God's word alone. Mm-hmm. And so there are certain things that I think clarify the boundaries of what a Christian church is. Absolutely. And when people wander outside of that, which is which has happened in many churches, yeah. um, then then some would say they're no longer in that circle of, of faith in that. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely, I mean, I think you definitely see that as well in, throughout the entire world, r- regardless of a religious organization or yeah. not. And I, it's it's interesting how that's being challenged a lot in uh, our community today. But, um, you know, as we're looking at, at Romans, I know that that's kind of the initial discussion that we have with Paul mm-hmm. as we're reading mm-hmm. um, is just this reality that there there are boundaries. Mm-hmm. There There is a, a reality of what the Bible called sin. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm curious, you know, where, what your thoughts are and as far as, you know, I think that when we're looking at, at Romans and you're looking at the, the idea that Paul puts forward as sin, um, it's hard to, it's hard to, to deal with that in groups where we want to, you know, maybe, uh, change the way the Bible affects our lives and, be a little uh, kinder, yeah, a little more gentler, gentler. Yeah, and I'm, yeah. I'm just curious, like, how do we, how do we reconcile that? How do we, yeah. how do we have some clarity on yeah. that? When you read Romans, yeah, it seems really clear, yeah, um, and it seems straightforward, uh, and and I know there's a lot of discussion about yeah. the different things in the the first half of Romans. So, kind of just, what's your take on that as a preacher? Yeah. And, and and I think the Apostle Paul, when you read the whole book of Romans. Mm-hmm you recognize that Paul is trying to get to this. He, he's describing this thing he calls the gospel, mm-hmm. which means good news. Yeah, he, He's trying to be clarify it. But within that good news, there's the reality of bad news. Mm-hmm. That bad news is that human beings have sinned. We have offended God. We have, we have stood against God. As a matter of fact, as we walk through the series at Shoreline, these series of sermons, we're going to get to some of the passages where Paul just starts listing things where you go, whoa, he's, he's like incredibly mm-hmm. serious about this, this issue of sin. Yeah. Uh, I have found that there are people today, and I think part of what you're asking is, you know, there's pushback, you know, yeah. well, guys, do we have to deal with sin? There, my, my wife some years ago was a children's director yeah. and she was working with a curriculum that was a very popular curriculum that was being recommended to be used at our church. So yeah. she dug into it. She went and studied with the person who developed the curriculum, mm-hmm. went to a seminar. And then she started looking at this curriculum and realizing this person never mentioned sin. Yeah. Not just the word, yeah. but they avoid the harshness of the reality that human beings are right. broken, are fall, you know, fallen, have rebelled against God. Yeah. And so she uh, kind of raised her hand and asked a question <laughs> in one of these training times. And in effect, this woman who developed this curriculum said, uh, well, I don't really you know, do the sin thing. I don't really talk about the sin thing. This is a curriculum for children, and that's a harsh thing. And that's, but, then, yeah. but then what Sherry realizes is she wasn't just trying to hide this from children. Yeah. She was trying to avoid it for, for human beings, yeah. period. And if you ask the Apostle Paul when you read the book of Romans, can you share the good news of what Jesus has done and what he saved us from and avoid this problematic thing called sin? Paul would say, no. Cannot be done. Yeah. You yeah. cannot hear the full good news of the gospel unless you understand the bad news of sin and what God's saving us from. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think I in because it, it, it brings up another thing that I I feel like I hear a lot with um, friends, family. Uh, mm-hmm. I definitely uh, hear this a lot in this this idea of like scales, like different, mm-hmm. uh, you know, having different level of intensity of sin, mm-hmm. or or I get to choose, mm-hmm. um, man, and and uh, I don't know the yeah. when you look at the Book of Romans, I feel like it comes pretty pretty clear with that pretty detailed um, pretty specific yeah it, it feels like it yeah, is yeah, yeah uh but yeah um so in in uh the message that you just uh preached on romans one mm-hmm. uh you took sin uh pretty seriously so yeah. um uh, i'm curious just why why is mm-hmm. it such a big deal for yeah. god i yeah. guess that's the the yeah the the question to really look at romans with yeah and i would say i take my cue on the seriousness of sin from the apostle paul yeah and i think he took his cue 
from the heart of God. Mm -hmm. Uh, God takes sin seriously. Yeah. Uh, God understands, and, and, I, and I think this is important, Cole, as we think about the heart of God and the, and the gospel mm -hmm. and the book of Romans. Um, when God takes sin so seriously, it's driven out of his love for us. Yeah. If you, Cole, if you are watching somebody that you love and you care about, walk into peril, walk into danger. Yeah. Okay, you, you're, you're, you've got a wife, Mackenzie, you love her. And if you knew she was you know, kind of crossing a street and a car was coming and she didn't see it, if you love her the way I know you do, you would scream, you would yell, you would, if you had to dive and tackle her, do that, 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 yeah. you know, that, that, that dive and tackle, you know, that big scene in movies where yeah, the car goes by, whoom, she's yeah. safe. And you're that romantic glancing into each other's yeah. eyes at the ground. Yeah. But, but you, know, you go, you go, you, you wouldn't, you would just stand there and ignore it. You no. would take it deeply. And, and in the moment of the reality, yeah. you would respond out of the passion of your heart. Well, that's the heart of God for his children. Mm -hmm. He loves us deeply and mm -hmm. passionately. He understands the consequence of sin way worse than being hit by being hit by a car. Yeah. He, he understands the eternal consequences. He wants us to be in eternal relationship with him in glory in heaven forever. I mean, his love for us is so passionate and so good and yeah. so beautiful. And so the passion of God's you know, r r outrage mm -hmm. and anger over sin is that it destroys the children he loves. Yeah. And he's, he's seeking to protect us. Also, God also knows the cost of sin on his own only son, Jesus Christ, who yeah. died on the cross for our sins. Yeah. God the Father knows the cost of sin that Jesus had to give his life for our sins. So if you look at the Bible and you say, man, God takes sin really seriously, or Paul takes sin really seriously, or if you're hearing me preach, you go, oh, yeah. Pastor Kevin takes sin really seriously. <laughs> There's a progression there. It's all coming from the heart of yeah. God. And any Christian who says they take the Bible seriously, who loves people, is going to care. And I've had this conversation with people through the years where, where people who's in their theology, they're trying to push sin away, mm -hmm. not deal with it. People who still want to hold the name Christian, but really minimize sin mm -hmm. and minimize the consequence of sin. And so I've actually said to people, I look right in the eyes and I'll say, listen, you may not like the fact that I take sin so seriously. You may not like the fact that there are certain things that I believe the Bible teaches are sin that as Christians... We, we stand against right now we're not we don't hate people but we 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 stand against the reality of sin and, and the, the consequences of sin yeah and i may i say to them you may not like that but i said can you can you at least look at me and recognize that if i'm loving someone and if i believe this is true that this particular sin could push them away from god yeah or could put them in peril can you at least understand that i'm acting out of love and compassion and not and because what people look at say you're a bad guy if you yeah, do that sin no can, and, and other people say no, I can't see that. Yeah. For the most part, they can't. Yeah. I mean, they're honest and they're going, no, if you don't, if you can't embrace that particular thing that the Bible calls sin, if you can't say it's okay or look the other way, you're not loving. You're a yeah. mean person. And I think that's becoming even more polarized in our world today. If you can't agree with what, the way I see the world, mm -hmm. you're a bad person. Yeah. But I think the heart of God is to say, if we recognize the cost of sin, the consequence of sin, if we believe the Bible is true and people are heading to, toward peril yeah. and a car is bearing down on them about to hit them. Yeah. Our response isn't a response of anger or hatred. It's a response of compassion and yeah. love. And I wish people could see that. Yeah. I, I think too, uh, cause you, you were calling, you know, the children of God, but uh, when you're describing the, the scenario with Mackenzie and I, my wife, yeah. uh, it reminded me of, of, you know, the biblical description of the bride of Christ as yeah. well. And, and that really puts, you know, as you were saying that it puts a, a huge perspective, uh, into my mind. And it reminded me as well, when you were talking about, you know, just the, people today, not, you know, people in general, but I think there's a sense that, you know, if we're, if we're in opposition, uh, that we can't love each other, that we can't, um, uh, invest in each other's lives. Yeah. And man, I, I think Mackenzie, if she was standing next to me now w would agree with me wholeheartedly that mm -hmm. there's so many things that we disagree yeah. on. Yeah. And, and I've noticed, just, I've noticed that with the you two have, no, yeah. no. <laughs> uh, just us being around, you know, no, yeah. but I, it just reminds me that, you know, even when there's this reality of sin uh, that happens in the church or just with people yeah. uh, in general, the, the Lord loves us and, yeah. and he seeks after us. And I, I just had that image in my head when you're when you're talking about the just the realities that that there is sin that doesn't it doesn't have to mean yeah. Uh, that we're not, that we're isolated, that we're right. alone, that we're not sought after. Or, 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 that, or that we end up having to hate each other because we disagree. Yeah. I've, yeah. I've shared I've shared this with our congregation before, but I grew up in a home with a mom who was the president of the Teachers Association mm -hmm. and a staunch Democrat. Yeah. And, and a bright, articulate Democrat. And my dad was a staunch, bright, articulate Republican. Yeah. 
And uh, we would have fiery conversations. As a matter of fact, I, my, my family would have these fiery conversations. So I'll get in a conversation with somebody that I think gets pretty heated, but I'm having fun. Yeah. And I yeah. find out later I hurt their feelings. And I'm like, get over it, you big baby. I'm thinking, what? Yeah. Honestly, we're having a conversation. But I'm realizing, well, I got to be careful with some people mm -hmm. because they think if you disagree and you disagree strongly and articulately that you don't like them. Yeah. And my parents would literally go off to vote together. Yeah. And they would, my dad would kind of over his shoulder say, hey, we're heading out to cancel out each other's votes. And yeah. he meant it. I mean, they were yeah. like, they were like just, it was a net zero, but they so believed in the process yeah. and they so appreciated being part of, part of a country that gave them the freedom to vote. They would go and do it yeah. knowing that by the time they went, voted and came home, nothing had changed because yeah. they, they'd X'd each other out. But I watched my parents love each other for, I got to, I got to do a renewal of their vows mm -hmm. at their 50th wedding anniversary before my mom passed away. And, uh, and they loved each other, yeah. even though they, they disagreed strongly. And I, as a pastor and as a Christian, I can have really close friends that I strongly disagree with. We can articulate it. We can go back and forth, but we love each other. Yeah. And I think that's something, I think that that's something that's missing in our world today. And if, yeah. if anyone's going to recapture that, it has to be Christians who Absolutely. say we stand before Jesus united, even though we disagree on, on other issues. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I feel that with, uh, a big thing that that challenges me on is my friendships. I think, yeah. I, was, I think a lot about, you know, the friends that I have and having these, these challenging discussions where we are very clearly in opposition, very yeah. clearly in disagreement, but man, it's, it's such a richer relationship. I yeah. feel, I, you know, uh, where we can discuss things and mm -hmm. have, have conversations that challenge each other. And, yeah. and, uh, you know, I, I think for some people that's a difficult thing to walk through, but, uh, man, those are the, the relationships in my yeah. life that I, I really cherish. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've talked with people and I think this is true. There's people on both sides of the issue, whether it's mm -hmm. political faith issues, moral issues, you know, whatever it is, yeah. people on both sides that are saying, I've had family members and close friends who it's cost me our relationship absolutely, because yeah. we disagree. And I think how heartbreaking yeah. that, that, you know, what kind of a relationship was it? And are, are, yeah. have, we, have we become so polarized uh, that we can't have those conversations and disagree and remain friends and go out yeah. and have dinner and laugh and talk and say, you know, hey, we may disagree, but we can mm -hmm. still love each other. And, and I think God wants us to grow in that. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, so I, I did want to talk about something that, um, you know, there some two big examples uh, of sin that uh, you addressed in your sermon yeah. that... Uh, can I think be a difficult discussion for a lot of people. So, um, you know, the, these two examples in Romans one are idolatry and sexual immorality. And mm -hmm. so, uh, I kind of want to hear your, your take a little more, uh, in depth than, than what you did on your sermon, yeah. um, of why God is concerned about that. Why is yeah. that such a, yeah. a common thing? As we look throughout the Bible, you see yeah. it in the old Testament, you see it in yeah. the new Testament, you see it in obviously Romans, mm -hmm. you see it a lot in Re uh, revelation, yeah. I believe, you Absolutely, know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, what, what's the, what is God's concern yeah. with those two things? Yeah. You know, I think, I think what, what the heart, what God is getting at from his heart is he's trying to give those big examples of the mm -hmm. things that are core issues. Uh, that, that go to the core of God's heart for us and, right. and God's love for relationship. Mm -hmm. So you think about, uh, and, and, and in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus is, uh, he's being confronted by different religious groups and they're mm -hmm. trying to, they're trying to test him, catch him, corner him, trap him. Uh, a friend of mine, Nabil Qureshi, when he was still living, uh, he preached at our church mm -hmm. and he talked about, he saw this series of attacks by the different religious leaders, like a, like an old karate movie where the different groups would come and fight. And then the guy <laughs> would fight this one and fight that one. I thought it was a beautiful picture. Yeah. And it's like these little battle after battle after yeah. battle. And they wouldn't all come at one time. They all kind of like one person, yeah. one battle in the next battle. So this is after a series of these little battles and somebody comes <laughs> and says, your teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And this is in Matthew twenty two thirty seven. So listen to these words. I'm just going to read it right from the Bible here. It says, Jesus replied, love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Mm -hmm. This is the first and the greatest commandment. So number one, just love God with all that yeah. you are. He says, he says, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Yeah. So Jesus says, listen, here's the, the two big things. Love God, love people. Yeah. And everything else kind of follows that. Well, I, I, this, this is just an insight I've had because I've been actually memorizing the first, I'm trying to memorize the first five chapters of Revelation. I'm almost yeah. done with chapter two and I memorized chapter one, but in chapter two, when it goes to the letters of the churches mm -hmm. in one of the letters, it holds up and it kind of warns the people about, about idolatry and sexual mm -hmm. immorality. And then the letter to the church at Thyatira, which I'm working on memorizing right now, which is really complex. 
it talks about this false prophet who's enticing people to sexual immorality mm -hmm. and idolatry. So it's idolatry and immorality, immorality and idolatry. And those things come up again and again. <clears throat> and, and I think, I think when I say their core, I'd say they're almost like, uh, archetypical. I mean, they're, yeah. they're, they're like, yeah. a, they're, they're a, a singular massive example. Yeah. So if you say, if, if you say the first and greatest commandment is to love God with all you are, right. Well, what's a way that you can deeply break that at the core of that love relationship? It's idolatry. Yeah, absolutely. It's saying, I'm putting something else above God. I'm worshiping mm -hmm. something above God. So idolatry is the breaking of the first commandment. Now, there's lots of other ways we can break it. But I think it, it's that, it's that uh, unique, massive example of fighting against loving God with all that we are. Right. The second commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. So when the Bible talk when the Bible talks against sexual immorality, I think what it's, it's getting to is is it's breaking that second commandment. Yeah. It's that big example of when we break God's plan and our relationship with others on a sexual level, we're doing it at the core of who we are. Right. Our sexuality, our maleness, our femaleness, our sexuality. Some, somebody who's been abused sexually would say they, they were damaged at the core of their being yeah absolutely. because yeah, our sexuality time. is core to yeah. who we are right yeah and so it's not a small side thing it's very core so i think when the bible talks about idolatry and sexual immorality it's saying these are sins because they yeah. break our relationship with god yeah and they break our relationship with each other yeah. and even when we when we wander into sexual immorality that we think is fine god says you may not recognize it but we, we, you know, think about it. when you're in a covenant relationship of marriage yeah. and you commit adultery, you have sexual relations with someone outside that covenant. God says you have broken you, you're that's that sexual immorality. You're breaking not only the relationship you have with your spouse, but there's an offense to the other person that you are betraying this relationship with. And yeah. it's core to who we are. And when God says, this is how I want you to live as a sexual person. Mm -hmm. And we say, I'm not going to live within those boundaries. I'm going to do it my own way. It, it's hard to commit sexual immorality by yourself. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> it involves another person. It's quarter. So, so again, idolatry is breaking of the first and great commandment. Yeah. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Sexual immorality is a breaking of the second commandment that Jesus says is like it. Love yeah. your neighbor as yourself. And so if you go and read chapter two of Revelation, mm -hmm. you read Romans chapter one, you read Matthew chapter 22. I think you start to get a picture that Jesus is using illustrations because in, in the book of Romans chapter one, right after Jesus addresses the, the specific sins of sexual immorality, he doesn't list all the sins of sexual, sexual immorality. He just gives some examples. Right, right. But then in the next part of, the, of that chapter, he lists about 15 other yeah. sins. Yeah. So, so, and I think so that every person who's listening would say, oh, wait a That's minute. Me. That's me. Yeah, I feel yeah. that. Greedy. Oh, that one's for me. Yeah. This. Oh, and, and all of a sudden, you, instead of pointing your finger at one person, we, we you know, right. in, in ways, we all commit idolatry. We put things above God. We all compromise who we are as human beings. And and so Paul goes on and gives specifics so, so that we could, and what goes in my mind is that you're reading that list, you should have like a, a flag go up, a little ding, bell yeah. ring, and go, oh, that one's me. That one's me. Some people are going, to, oh, ding, 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 yeah. ding, ding, and all of them. Some people are like, oh, that one and that one are really me. But I think, again, God is getting back to the heartbeat that we started with. Mm -hmm. And that is that he loves us. He wants the best for us. And the best thing for every human being is to love God intimately and have great relationships with people. Yeah. And God says, when you wander into idolatry, when you wander into immorality, you begin to compromise the integrity of those two greatest things that yeah. God gives us in life. Yeah. Yeah, man. I have a lot of questions about that, but mm -hmm. I want to move to this next question just to kind of, we have a time frame. but uh, mm -hmm. I, I think lastly, what I want to ask uh, as we're kind of wrapping up is why is it so essential mm -hmm. uh, for Christians to really know what they believe, their yeah. orthodoxy yeah. and to hold to it, you know, with, yeah. with a, just a, a confident faith, you know, yeah. why, why is that so important for Christians? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would say because of the connection of orthodoxy to orthopraxy. Yeah. What we believe dictates what we do. Okay. If I believe that everything I earn and have, mm -hmm. I got myself and my own power and it's mine, I'm never going to be generous. Yeah. If I believe that uh, what the book of James says, that every good and perfect gift comes from above, yeah. from, from our heavenly father, uh, if I believe that, and if I believe he then calls me to be compassionate and to care about the poor, and to love the broken, mm -hmm. I look and say, oh, what I'm getting is not just a resource for me. That's part of it. And God's yeah. providing for me and my family. Wonderful. Yeah. But that's not the whole story. 
all of a sudden my orthopraxy is I'm going to be generous. I'm going to keep my eyes open to notice if there's a brokenness in the world that I can actually make a difference in. Right. And I got to say, because I didn't grow up in a Christian home with a model of that, when I became a Christian in the area of generosity, <laughs> I didn't really give because I just thought, well, you know, you work hard, you earn it. The, you know, good American thing. You know, it's, 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 it's me and work hard, the old bootstraps. And yeah. it's for me. And, uh, and when I met my wife to be, and she modeled a biblical vision and taught me the scriptures about generosity, my beliefs mm -hmm. changed my lifestyle. So Cole, to your question, why is our orthodoxy so core? Uh, especially the things that are the core of orthodoxy that, you know, salvation is in Jesus Christ alone. Yeah, yeah. The Bible is the word of God. We believe in one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There's an eternal condition that awaits all of us. Yeah. And God invites us into his presence. You know, all those things. Um, if we don't know what we believe, we don't know how to live. Yeah. And too many people today who would claim, well, I don't have a set belief system. You know, they no. do have some kind, <laughs> yeah. but, but if they, if they have very weak beliefs and no clarity, their lives will wander. Mm -hmm. And I think that, so as followers of Jesus Christ, for the listeners that are followers of Jesus, yeah. to know what you believe, to believe it with deep conviction, to hold it with, with confident hands and a confident heart, being loving and gracious to others who are in a different place, yeah. but you know, knowing what you believe will lead you to right lifestyle, orthopraxy, yeah. and there's nothing better than waking up in the morning yeah. and knowing why you're on this planet, what you have to do, that, that you're following God who has a plan and a vision and a way to walk and and to put your you know, head on the pillow at the end of the night and say, you know what, I, I, I live my life out of a depth of conviction. Mm -hmm. I live my life the best I could yeah. with, with failings and falling and the reality of sin is all of sin and falling short of the glory of God. Yeah. We're going to learn that in <laughs> Romans chapter three. Yeah. Uh, but, but that God's good gift is grace. Yeah. And man, there's no better way to live. Yeah, man. I feel that. Well, hey, Kevin, thank you. I know you have a, a very busy schedule. I know you're doing a lot of things right now. We're, we're excited to dig more into Romans. And yeah. yeah, thank you for kind of shedding some light on the realities of orthodoxy. And I look forward to, you know, future conversations with me, yeah. with others, with mm -hmm. uh, just the way that this is going to develop. We're, we're, I'm yeah. really excited about this. So thank you for your time. Yeah, and uh, yeah, thank you all for listening. And uh, we'll see you next time. All right. Whether you're watching this podcast on our YouTube channel or listening on your podcast app, make sure to subscribe to hear our weekly episodes during the Roman series and hopefully regularly afterwards. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next week back with another interview from Pastor Kevin.